topics do we want to discuss? And of course, it sounds like a very boring topic, but on the other hand, my experience is that if you enter crypto stabilization, you can have quite some excitement. I think the first observation, and I will let Pavel comment more on this, if you look at the big stabilist credit in crypto in the last decade, it's AES and SHA3, and they were designed in Europe, and the NIST made the decisions. And now there is a post quantum competition, again, there is many European entrants, but in the end, the decisions are taken by the US. US it's taken most of the calls, except for Etsy, where Europe has some decision power, but for many IT systems, it seems that we don't in charge of our own standards. Also, which key length should we use? Uh, and there is recommendations for this, uh, typically by national bodies. The ECRIP Network of Excellence, about uh, 12 years ago, started making recommendations for the European market uh, to comply with data privacy directive. Um, the pleasure directive, but also for the banks, this was widely used. It was then taken over by ENISA, and then ENISA was actually asked two years ago to unpublish those requirements because they actually are violating the limitations of what the Commission can do, and they're dealing with national security. Um, luckily, there is still an ECRI project, and we plan to publish new guidelines next month. But I don't think anybody can ask us to unpublish those. Um, and then certification of products. I wouldn't say too much about this, but I mean, this morning you heard that there will be renewed initiatives um, in the EU, and that common criteria seems to be in the focus. Um, and then I think maybe the final more broader topic, um, if you look at China, China has said every crypto used in China should be designed in China. The Russians still say it, but they do the same thing. Um, and so we design the crypto for the Americans. So the question is, should we have our own crypto sovereignty, or should we work together more, but at least make sure we can also together make decisions. And I think with those four points, I will open the floor to the panelists, and I propose that Nigel starts. Oh my god, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to tell still right, it's not a different process, right. Okay, so, um, there's some points I'd like to make, which is, um, especially for the uh, large number of youngsters in the audience, whether anybody younger than me is a youngster, um, is that as cryptographers, people focus a lot on ITF standards and NIST. So you've all heard of AES, you've all heard of uh, uh, SHA-3, and you've all heard of TLS 1.3. But actually, um, in, in industry, what's the more important standards are, 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 the, are the certification standards, which are all either NIST, the FIT series, or the common criteria that we've heard about. So, um, which is basically, if you have a crypto product and you want to sell your crypto product, it has to be certified. It does what it says it does on the tin, yeah? It doesn't actually have to do this. What the, what the companies want is they want a badge on it so the lawyers in the company can say it's been badged. If anything goes wrong, it's someone else's fault, not ours. So it's kind of a risk, a risk mitigation strategy. And what we heard earlier today was an idea for Europe to kind of step up in certification. Now one of the problems of the certification system is that the standards that they are certifying against are mainly government standards. They're looking at crypto definitions for government requirements. Whereas what you see when you advise companies is that they would like products certified which have more advanced, and here I'm talking 1980s crypto, you know, zero knowledge proof, secret sharing, you know, nothing really high tech. This is advanced crypto, it's not a block cipher, it's not a public key algorithm. But there are virtually no standards, and there's certainly no certification of that. In fact, the only standards I know for zero knowledge proof is U proof, which is just a Microsoft internal standard. There's nothing to find. So there's loads of standards that are needed by companies, and also certification of products, whatever that means, to keep the lawyers happy. So that's point one that we need to be broader on what we mean. My other point was uh, the key size document, apparently, because apparently I edited it. Um, this is, you know, the question is, do, one, do we need it? Do we need it to be updated every year? It, I've been editing it for now, God knows how many years, eight years or so, probably longer. And it's very conservative, so very little changes. We don't introduce new algorithms into it. So in some sense, it's probably better to, if it was like a living document that was only updated when something changes, it would be better than having a published at a specific time. But 
The issue is with this a document like it is if you're securing something like GDPR, it, things have to be suitably encrypted. So how do companies find out, or government or, or uh, organisations find out that it's suitably encrypted if the only document that, that the um, European Commission publishes, or the European Commission comes up with GDPR, the only document that tells people what is suitably encrypted is unpublished. So, in some sense, this is kind of a bit, a bit weird. But finally, on crypto sovereignty, we need to distinguish between coming up with the algorithm and producing the box. So, crypto sovereignty, um, if you normally, what governments normally mean about this is that the boxes that they buy to go in fighter planes or to secure their own um, um, communications, which they call cryptos, which we call HSMs. I mean, crypto sovereignty is they control the manufacturer. The manufacturer is in their geographic jurisdiction. And given the global supply chains, I, I doubt very few uh, countries could enable that these days. Probably Europe might not be able to. And with that, I end. What's more with Claire Richie from Intel? So, um, Brian sent us four questions, uh, and uh, I'm going to try to address uh, four of them in a very brief way so that uh, we could address them in depth if there is interest uh, afterwards. So, um, the first question, question or topic for discussion was uh, the potential uh, or perceived weakness uh, of Europe in crypto standardization. Other than uh, with regard to uh, mobile telephony, uh, well, uh, standardization uh, does not only uh, rely on standards uh, bodies, uh, it's also individual participants uh, that bring standards to uh, all kinds of standards bodies, uh, to were mentioned uh, by uh, Nigel. Uh, already, and uh, there is significant participation in Europe. Uh, well, coincidentally, uh, I had a discussion of this nature uh, in the U.S. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, and uh, the example uh, of Europe uh, was uh, promoted as the right way to do things. Uh, indeed, it was said, uh, uh, the discussion was at NIST, uh, in Europe, uh, there is a requirement for standardization when you submit a research proposal. And this certainly creates uh, a number of qualified, uh, technically uh, expert participants to standards bodies. Even uh, if this participation is superficial and uh, not uh, the most important part of the research project, it still brings uh, to the standards bodies the kind of expertise that makes uh, Europe uh, strong. Uh, certainly the perception outside of Europe is that uh, there is significant European achievement uh, in uh, standardization of uh, algorithms. Uh, it is true that it is NIST that uh, is organizing the competitions for uh, what is perceived as the greatest need uh, today. But uh, you may observe that very frequently the winners of these competitions come from Europe, uh, and uh, this is not uh, surprising. Uh, so, um, I think uh, Europe uh, is very well positioned. Uh, potentially, there isn't the same vis visibility as the US is getting uh, through uh, NIST competitions, or China is getting through controversy in positioning cryptography. Uh, but in terms of technical strengths and influence on uh, what is standardized, uh, in terms of uh, people who are being listened to, I think uh, the positioning is excellent. So uh, the second topic was um, how can uh, industry uh, and, uh, well, I guess uh, academia uh, collaborate with regard to uh, recommendations on how to uh, implement cryptography. Uh, this is a more uh, complicated issue. Uh, certainly for each particular project uh, that 
uh, comes to mind in industry or in academia, there is some level of collaboration. There is typically uh, an uh, industry advisory board for European projects. Uh, there is collaboration with uh, academics in Europe and elsewhere uh, when uh, something new uh, or unusual uh, is developed in uh, industry. But um, I'm not sure that uh, we have uh, determined uh, how to do it better. Uh, well, uh, positioned as I am, sort of working a lot with academia, but also working in industry, I can see that the need is really uh, to be able to conduct a body of experts uh, when um, a, a serious question comes up that's not easy to resolve, where different opinions uh, of experts would be appreciated rather than creating general papers with uh, best practices. Those are also useful, but they probably belong in standards bodies uh, as uh, submissions uh, from different national bodies and uh, reports. So there, I think, uh, we can do a lot more than we are doing now, uh, but we need to create a mechanism that will uh, allow us to do this. Uh, Encrypt is an excellent mechanism and perhaps it could be developed to be more responsive and broader, sort of like, you know, Doctors Without Borders for cryptography. <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, something better, I am sure, could be proposed and uh, invented. So, uh, now certification of products is something uh, where we can spend uh, the rest of this day and the rest of this week uh, and uh, have a lot of excellent opinions and uh, not come to conclusion. Uh, well, um, obviously, common crit criteria uh, is a good mechanism. Um, it has been endorsed uh, through uh, a number of uh, products and by the international community. Uh, people who are countries that are not using common criteria actually are using the concepts from common criteria. For instance, in China, there are companies uh, that run common criteria tests <laughs> even though they do not provide common criteria certification. And those companies are in great uh, demand. However, uh, when you compare uh, the effort that's needed uh, to certify anything through common criteria to uh, the way uh, products uh, are created and how many of them we have. Um, it's clearly uh, well, impossible to certify everything or even most things. Uh, you would need hundreds of thousands of uh, evaluators. So uh, various um, approaches were proposed. Uh, not uh, least the one that's used uh, in the U.S. where certification can happen uh, in six weeks uh, but uh, the creation of the profile requires years and uh, even though the certification itself takes six weeks perhaps uh, the information that you need to collect for uh, the certification to happen uh, certainly takes a lot longer. If we are talking about FIMS, that is specifically oriented to uh, uh, cryptography or its uh, ISO, IC equivalent, uh, the story is the same, although uh, it's probably more adapted for uh, cryptographic tools. So um, what can we do? If the goal is to certify as many products as uh, possible, um, to create sort of a requirement where almost everything has to be certified, then probably some other uh, ways uh, need to be taken. Uh, there should be some kind of, uh, you know, um, a graduation of the requirements for certification. Uh, maybe the most uh, secure environments uh, will benefit from complete tips and um, common criteria. Then uh, another way to approach some of the tests is through test automation, something that NIST has done a lot of work on with regard to FIPS 140. Um, then uh, the next level could be some uh, self-assessment uh, and self-certification, um, some kind of 
uh, benchmarking, something that uh, the product makers could do uh, themselves. When you think about it, uh, well, really, this is not different from the uh, lowest levels of certification of FIPS and the FIPS of common criteria. Uh, EL1 uh, or level 1 just requires documentation, and there is no reason why they sh this shouldn't be done without uh, a huge third party process. Uh, so, um, we have started um, actually with the Chinese national body. Uh, uh, um, study period on a standard, uh, rather a process that would uh, uh, allow to collect uh, already existing standard-based best practices based on uh, reasoning algorithms so that you don't start from scratch every time a new uh, technology area appears. Um, it's, uh, there are so many standards, really hundreds and thousands, and uh, they are all for um, assessment. Uh, they are all reusable. Uh, I think a lot could be done uh, just by uh, creating an inventory of best practices that could be used for specific assessments. But uh, I don't want to talk too, more about, uh, too much about it. And finally, um, cyber sovereignty. Uh, well, obviously, science is global, certification is global, the digital economy is global. Um, regionalization of uh, science, uh, especially for cryptography um, or standardization, uh, simply um, is simply impossible. Uh, well, this is because crypto is used in everything, uh, every device, every application, uh, every applet. Uh, that we have uses elements of crypto. So how can this be done uh, differently uh, in Germany, uh, in Turkey, in China, in the US, uh, and in Canada? Um, well, this is something that uh, is really very difficult to imagine. Every region has uh, its own requirements uh, and its own uh, principles and these principles, of course, have to be respected. Uh, but there is a difference between sovereignty uh, and uh, respecting uh, the principles by which uh, certain regions uh, operate. So uh, I think that they are excellent questions, and uh, I am looking forward to discussing them more. Thank you, Claire. Next is uh, Harry. Yeah, so I'm going to build off uh, what. Claire and Nigel just said. So I worked for a number of years in, uh, as an employee of the World of Web Consortium, where we did a lot of standardization, primarily aimed at web browsers, um, with the web photography, uh, which uh, kind of deployed photography into the JavaScript runtime environment, and also web authentication to build off of the Commission's earlier presentation, trying to standardize passwordless secure graphic multi-factor <laughs> authentication across all browsers that came current W3C web authentication that would be a, a, from the FIDO alliance. So we've had some successes. I think uh, to a large extent uh, it's true that the uh, IETF and W3 standards are not the ones that really matter to most companies. Lawyers, I do think in practice they have had uh, some influence uh, in the, the of cryptography, I think to some extent the release of drug standards from RSA into the IETF helped the uh, ability for W3C to royalty uh, to, to have royalty-free licensing of cryptography and cryptography protocols definitely helps adoption. And on some level, uh, these uh, standards organizations are essentially organizations for the global uh, public good. Uh, and our common infrastructure, which uh, are, however, uh, there are problems. So these standards bodies are historically uh, dominated by American companies. Uh, the IETF has, for a long time, uh, had a very cozy relationship with the U.S. government and the NSA in particular, uh, due to uh, the historical development of the internet. And we've seen uh, both good and bad things happen. So I think. Uh, for example, after the Snowden revelations, I think the ITF did do uh, some house cleaning, so to speak. The NSA 
was forced to uh, step down from the cryptographic research forum, which recommended that cryptography standards use ITF protocols. They were, strangely enough, chairing the group. Uh, at the same point, we've also seen problems such as the uh, push through of uh, digital rights management schemes in the browsers uh, via American corporations uh, who did that despite uh, questions being asked uh, on the European parliamentary, parliamentary level. So the question being, uh, you know, while maybe the United States has a clear role in DMCA in countries such as India, or even you're doing something like streaming video between Greece and the UK, or the UK and Greece, vice versa, uh, different legal regimes apply to copyright, there's different uh, fair use exceptions, and should a sort of single uh, standard be pushed by a small group of companies uh, led by Netflix and Google. And um, you know, the fact of the matter is that I think for too long, um, you know, Europe has essentially let the IETF and W3C uh, be on uh, autopilot. Occasionally, there's been engagement. There's an engagement from, for example, ABC for Trust, the jury based credential work, and then Rep. Crypto. Uh, there's been some engagement by Europe, but for example, when ABC for Trust was like, hey, why don't we uh, try to standardize some interesting elliptic curve as recovery matrix publications? And Microsoft said, sure. Uh, this was killed uh, by Google and Mozilla uh, without anyone from the European Commission noticing that because of that, a very hard employ attribute based credentials in a browser-based environment. Had there been more European support of engagement standards bodies and uh, more also European, uh, I would say, aggressiveness in engaging with standards which were being taken over by a few small uh, companies, uh, we would have probably had different results. You would be running different crypto in your browser today. Um, so I think the numbers of successes and failures, the fact of the matter is that we've seen uh, even people like Tim Berners-Lee essentially back down and uh, go against their principles, uh, which they previously stated when pressured by large companies, show that there needs to be more focus, more accountability uh, for standards bodies. Uh, they have huge impact. Having all decision making done by one man, and even if it's a very nice English man, does not mean that that man knows anything about cryptography or should have the ability to push uh, particular brands of crypto into web browsers. Uh, that being said, uh, Europe has done some very wonderful things as well. And one of the things that we did find very useful in standard vision was an ESA and the ECRIP reports. And typically at a global standards body, uh, we would be, for example, be standardizing crypto, and there would be comments from, you know, Russia would want ghost, you know, there would be a number of either paranoid or not so paranoid people that would, was unhappy with this curves unhappy with uh, dependence on American recommendations. Uh, within the CFRG, we found that Europe was uh, strangely enough viewed with the most trust globally in terms of cryptography. So that when we said, here's these recommendations from the US government, from NIST, which is you know, fairly straightforward, uh, there'd be some pushback sometimes from some non-American, non-European working group members. But when we said, hey, these are recommendations on key sizes from NISA, from from neutral European cryptographers, uh, this was accepted, and all of the ANISA uh, recommendations for key sizes and algorithm parameters uh, that report were, was then essentially blessed and worked into uh, the CFRG process, and then they recommend, recommended uh, parameters for web crypto. So I think that there's been a number of successes, and I guess my only take on message would be as someone in a standard body is it needs to be more. Uh, watchfulness and much more engagement uh, from the European uh, academic world, the European governments, and that requires, to be very honest, I mean, the standards work is not, um, is generally not recognized or approved of in academic bodies. Uh, this requires more funding, uh, more support for researchers to go to these expensive meetings and to, to spend the time on these mailing lists and get up discussions. Thank you, I'd like to give the talk again. Yes? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I am not an encryption specialist, nor am I a standards probably expert. I'm one of those lawyers 
uh, was referred to before that apparently one standard to cover their backside. Um, and I'll begin by saying that actually that's not true, or at least that's not true the way I have experienced it. Um, why is that? Sorry, I have to disagree. Uh, why is that? Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask how many of you have actually seen deployment of common criteria in a civilian environment? <laughs> that should tell you enough. The Belgian an ID card. Yeah. Well, that doesn't classify civilian environment. Well, civilian, okay, fair enough. It is civilian. <laughs> it's just feel about Belgium. No, it's civilian. <laughs> It's civilian, but it's government, central government, high stakes, high risk environment. Why am I saying that? Because quite frankly, my expertise has been that common criteria you'll see in only one environment, usually military. My vast majority of common criteria experience has been by working with organizations like NATO or working with organizations in ministries of defense around the world, I'm responsible for government affairs in everything for everything outside America, so in that sense. Trump is not my problem, everything else is. But it also means that when I look at the deployment of common criteria, we're talking about certification in you know, higher risk environments. We talk about the need for trust. So far, if the certification of the technologies around certification and usage of certification we see only in the military context, then I would like to ask the question, are we actually focusing correctly? Is there a market need the way we perceive it for the certification that we have in mind? I mean, critical infrastructure, energy providers. If, let's say, a particular type of certification is so good and so effective, why don't they use it? The answer is because if you look at the way common criteria are designed, they're primarily designed to address a different need. They're primarily designed to make sure that there are no hidden functionalities. Um, which means that that creates different problems when it comes to due to things like, for instance, updating the technologies and having perhaps to recertify them. So, I'm not saying that common criteria is bad, not at all, for the kind of things that common criteria are, are used for, they're very, very good. And equally, one of the things that we in Semantic are very, very supportive of is the realization that the common criteria are, actually the, the reality that common criteria is internationally recognized and as such uh, a key asset in your ability to instill trust and also to open markets. So when we're discussing about certification and standardization, I would actually encourage all of you to, to, to be thinking always to the following question. What's the market? Who is actually, for who, for what user, for what environment are we calling for all of these properties? For what business usage, for what use cases are we calling for this kind of capabilities? Why? Because I believe Napoleon said that the one who defends everything defends nothing. And guess what? Same way that we cannot defend everything, obviously we can't certify everything either. We don't have enough of certification experts and we probably don't have enough managers to go around certifying everything. Not everything needs to be certified or not everything has that level of security issue that would justify that, that, that level of certification or a level of certification. So what is the market impact in terms of the certification discussion go to market, how long does it take us to get something certified? I can tell you that the common criteria takes quite long. And what is also the cost implication? I can tell you, for instance, that from a, from a semantic standpoint, we're a big multinational company, we will be able to take the certification cost. And quite frankly, you can go on the NATO website and see how many of our technologies are certified to a particular NATO standard. The issue is that if let's say per box, per category or per product, we're looking at a million dollar cost for certification of one particular version, soon you realize that the objectives of certification that you want to meet on one hand versus the competitiveness of, uh, or the innovation for that matter, of European industry or of small and medium players, and there is some tension there that would need, need to be addressed. Um, so, we should also not lose sight 
of another reality. That certification and standardization, depending on how they're being used, could function as barriers to market, as barriers to market entry, could turn a very technological process, a process that is intended to, to meet specific market needs, to meet demands of customers around how they want their cybersecurity infrastructure to look like, may actually be turned into a very political decision-making issue. In fact, I think the previous speaker alluded to the fact that a, it can be used as a competitiveness tool because you've got large companies through the, through the standard-making bodies pushing for a particular direction which may exclude or include particular technologies depending on the, on the objective they're, they're trying to meet. So, um, when I look at the overall certification discussion, actually come to it from a different angle. Lawyers are going to put the certification requirement in the course for proposals because there is some policy that tells them that they must. The lawyers in NATO for sure will put them not because they're going to sue us if the certificate is, is not there. They're putting it because actually if the certificate is not there, we are not allowed to bid. We as a company who don't have a particular certificate, we, we, can't, you know, we can't participate in the tender point. So the certification question, I mean, it becomes an issue of does that technology meet the particular requirements and here's the proof, but it also becomes a condition upon which I can access the market or not. In which case I'd like to ask another question since all of you are still cryptologists and technology specialists. What is the kind of capability that we want when it comes to certification? Is it a capability that demonstrates us how much vulnerability and security by design there is on a particular technology that we're going to acquire or on a particular service that we want to use? Or is it a capability that shows how many, if any, hidden functionalities are in a piece of software at a given period in time? I think that's very important because it does tell us that the how many hidden or no hidden functionalities is easy to prove. It's easy to measure. On the other hand, the question of how much um, security by design is on a particular technology is something, something a lot more difficult. But I would argue that given where the threat landscape is evolving and the direction that it's taking, um, when we're thinking about certification, asking ourselves the question, do we have security by design in place? Do we have the right processes in place? Are we able to measure the vulnerability, so risk associated with a particular technology may prove to be a worthy goal or even sometimes more valuable goal to pursue on certification than just the how much black boxing hidden functionality there is or there isn't on a particular piece of software. I'll close with, um, with, with some thoughts on, on, on the digital sovereignty. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I was born in Europe. I got wife and kids in Europe. I got children who are younger than you. And I would ideally like them to live and work in Europe. I don't want my kids to have to travel to Singapore or to Shenzhou to find a job. So simple. Which means that it is in my interest, in my personal interest, irrespective of the, of the company I work for, that there is a competitive industry in Europe, also in ICT. And I say this why? Because fundamentally, Throughout the history of capitalism, you will not find anywhere the growth of a competitive industry, of an effective competitive industry that can compete globally on the basis of protectionism and closing borders and saying that we're going to develop something sovereign, nationally, and the hell with everybody else. Frankly, the examples are many, I don't need to go into detail on any of those, but the point is that if what we want to do is to build in Europe a competitive industry, the only way to do that is by actually trying to cooperate with others, learn from others, introduce some of these capabilities and blend them with our own and eventually develop something that can and will hopefully, as we've done in many places, compete effectively internationally. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions.
I think Nigel wants to respond. I want to kind of clarify what I meant by certification. So, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, not me back enough. Um, <laughs> certification. So, um, some of you may know, I've been involved in a few companies. And um, so, we sell stuff from unbound technology, otherwise known as diving, um, uh, into corporates. And the corporates demand that, that, that any crypto in there comes from a library that have been FIPS certified. So this is not a criminal criteria, this is FIPS certified that the libraries do exactly what FIPS require. But I've also done similar things with banks. And banks want to put stuff on your mobile phone. And the bank required that the library on your mobile phone was FIPS certified. You can get a FIPS certified library for your mobile phone, tick. It just doesn't do the crypto that would have secured the, app, the op, app, application. Because you can only certify RSA Elliptical signatures and AS and SHA-2 on a FIPS thing, yeah? Because it's a very restricted thing, thing of, of crypto. So what I'm talking about is actually selling software into a few corporates, not even big corporates, not even banks. You, if you go to the bank and say, hey, I've got this new piece of crypto, the first thing a large corporate, you know, a reasonable sized corporate will say to you is, is it FIPS certified? And, and, and if you're using anything that's not box bound crypto, you can't sell it. And that's what I mean by that. This actually creates a barrier to entry because the lawyers of that company will not allow them to buy anything that's not FIPS certified, even if you cannot FIPS certify the product that you're trying to sell. Most general companies, so not like military or anything, they they still need cryptography um, and do some encryption uh, at, at some level. Is it for GDPR or anything else? I mean, you want to do some encryption. And what you see in, in, in many companies is that there is not enough knowledge to do it. So maybe, I, I just thought that maybe the standardization is maybe too low level on like the very crypto protocols, crypto algorithms, which normal developers cannot use just because they you really need to understand how it works and then the, the small I don't know uh, small parts of it to, to not implement it wrong. And maybe if we could get some standardization on a, on a higher level where uh, usability is also important, uh, maybe that could help for, for general companies. Because I agree that for now the, the standardization is only for big companies with a lot of money or military these standardizations are useful. Ladies <laughs> first. Um, well, uh, I think there, uh, there is a number of uses of encryption. Uh, well, uh, in, in encryption libraries is, are not always required. Sometimes it is uh, a separate function. Most of the time it is a separate function that is used for uh, something, uh, for instance, uh, the integrity uh, of a piece of code uh, that's important, uh, or to protect the identity, or to ensure that the attestation protocol uh, votes, uh, well, works, uh, works as expected. Uh, so, um, while, uh, so when you look at uh, the encryption uh, from this point of view, uh, then uh, the potential barriers are uh, even broader. Well, I can understand to some extent uh, because libraries are frequently reused for a number of applications, how uh, you could uh, support uh, as a differentiated feature uh, the certification uh, the, just as a badge for uh, the libraries. It is similar to how it works for smart cards. Libraries are relatively stable uh, as a smart cards, and they work in the certification environment. But if you look at uh, how encryption is used uh, in general, in everything, if you require certification for all this uh, unique uh, small features, uh, then nothing is ever going to be uh, sold uh, or bought uh, or uh, prepared uh, for commercialization. It simply isn't possible. Uh, it simply isn't possible. I think uh, this telephone has what 
thousands, right? Uh, well, tens of thousands of these elements of encryption uh, that are unique for uh, every application. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I think it's important to understand this. Uh, it's not encryption for a GDPR. It's not encryption of the data to protect it. It's uh, elements of cryptography and everything. Um, so I think you start to see already some level of agreement, I sense, within the panel. Um, the example that Nigel previously gave, actually, I feel that it demonstrates very eloquently the point I was making before. The same way that standards can be very good because the military knows exactly what it needs to look for when it's looking for a device that's EAL 4 plus certified to be deployed in a NATO secret environment. Exactly the same way, <coughs> that specific standard or a requirement for a standard, in this particular case the FIPS libraries because the banks decided that they need to look like that, um, uh, can be used as a barrier to entry to a small, medium, innovative, new encryption algorithm that maybe does things better. Now there's no reason to do away with the standards, but that is a reason for us to think or to revisit the way we define the policy that dictates what kind of standard needs to be used, or at least the conditions that we put that would allow new entry in the market of a particular technology that may merit because of its capability standardization. The other thing, since I have the mic, uh, that we also need to remember is <coughs> the following. Um, we talk here about encryption, or at least I have a sense that we're talking about encryption as if it is only good, only positive. And whereas encryption is very positive, encryption is a baseline technology, encryption is critical to our ability to protect our information and our privacy, and under no circumstances we can support backdoors of any kind. We also need to realize that encryption is weaponized against us. WannaCry, Petya, technologies which actually have been used as a tool to render data of our own consumers unusable and operable. Not to mention that we are now getting gradually to a point whereby 50% of all the targeted attacks, because you spoke about GDPR, are using encrypted malware to extract confidential information. Which means what? The connection, the encrypted connection is between the victim and the hacker. The data is actually being siphoned out of our organization using encryption without us realizing it. So I say this because it's important to bear in mind, say with a knife, let's say cut the bread and kill someone, in the end the use of the technology and the standardization of the technology has to do also with who's using it. <laughs> Maybe to uh, poke up discussion a bit on, on common criteria, because also it was mentioned that this is the way member states are going. Um, it's good maybe to remind you that some countries had common criteria certified identity cards, apart from Belgium, namely Estonia, they had to be 400,000 after some small problem with RSA key generation. Um, well, I think 400,000 could be patched, and the other 400,000 couldn't. Then Latvia had to all of them, and also in Taiwan, again, common criteria evaluated, they had some problems with random numbers which was merged. Um, so I think that's one interesting point. The second point you may want to know is that if you read the common criteria, it says your cryptographic algorithm see your national body. <laughs> so if you like in Belgium, there is no national body. <laughs> Check with your member state. <laughs> and so, and then I think it's very interesting that on the one hand, member states are pushing for common criteria. On the other hand, the same member states, or some of them, are trying to stop an algorithm paper, which would help the banks and other users in countries where there is no national body to actually see what they should do. They're actually not told what they should use. And then finally, if you look at um, side channel resistance, there is the joint interpretation library. How do you measure those things? And they're secret. So they're not open to academic research or evaluation. This is just among the smart card companies and governments. They will decide what is good and bad. And so I'm kind of very concerned that the Commission allows the member states to push common criteria as a solution. I think Europe should maybe look more towards the FIPS than a European one. I don't know if the panel wants to comment on this. I, I, think, I think it's actually a huge... Uh, that's, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think it's a huge... Uh, 
um, step that Europe could do. It kind of wanted to uh, um, create a standards. If you create a standards that mirrored things, why would anyone use it? If you're a company, you're selling worldwide. You just want to authenticate your product once, so you would just go FIPS, because everyone knows what FIPS is. If there was standardizations of crypto that were beyond FIPS, that had gained more functionality than FIPS, and cut and you certified your product to that, that, that would allow European standards to leapfrog the US. There's no point duplicating what the US does. You actually have to leapfrog it, provide something that the market is actually requiring. And I'm going to just follow up on that. So while I think standards are a component, often the cutting edge of technology is by nature being cutting edge, um, unstandardized. So for example, um, you know, historically, you know, not only do you have I think the development of crypto in the United States because of investments by the U.S. government in encryption uh, that kind of trickled down and then led to successful United States companies based in the United States, you know, RSA, et cetera, et cetera. Attempts to repeat those companies in Europe have not been as successful. You know, some people made a little bit of money on patents, but no one's really repeated RSA. So, you know, on some level, though, Europe's in an interesting position now. I refer back to the previous panel. The amount, uh, historically, if you want to do a European company doing technology, you need funding. The European Commission will give you some small funding through an R&D project, perhaps your national government, a and in France, and who knows, whatever it is in Belgium, but it's not very much. A certain point you need to scale. Historically, you would then leave Europe. You would go to Silicon Valley, where the venture capital checks are much larger. Uh, now, what has definitely changed this equation is the amount of private capital, including venture capital, going in to blockchain-based companies, which are based in Europe, now has exceeded over the last year the amount of private venture capital going in to Silicon Valley-based startups going through traditional American uh, back VCs. Now, what's interesting, as someone who's known who works in standards is that we're now having this interesting situation where European blockchain startups, which are often heavily overly capitalized, uh, are coming to me and saying, I want to make my thing a standard. They don't, they, they don't even know what a standard is. But they believe it's a good thing, or they don't know if the standard is compliant, or there's some question about hash functions, the NSA, or whatever, or should we use Blake 2, whatever. There's all sorts of truly unique questions when it gets out the blockchain. And, um, but it not necessarily bode, it may bode very well for Europe that if there is a kind of cryptographic round, even if it's a bubble, of massive innovation and funding in Europe and not the United States, that Europe could use this to sort of meet the head of it. However, uh, unfortunately, what I see uh, as an American in Europe, I see a lot of uh, stifling on national level of uh, startups and innovation. Um, or at least just huge tax rates and excessive bureaucracy, uh, Switzerland being a sort of nice exception. And also I see within the European Commission uh, a favoritism towards large companies whose innovation potential is at this point non-existent or has been non-existent possibly for decades. And this has been a real problem because, um, for example, when you have real European success stories, such as the deployment of Adriana's Hackle Star Library uh, into Mozilla. So this is the first formally verified crypto library that really could possibly allow cutting edge of current cryptography to be deployed in a browser, which is nonprofit to a large extent mostly, and, uh, and which has tremendous innovation potential, such that now you're seeing Google Chrome and even Microsoft you know, has their own internal issues, but you know, Google Chrome trying to copy this sort of procedure and be very interested in some of the research coming out of essentially European R&D projects which is producing cryptographic libraries which don't need just test suites but actually are formally validated, which are faster, which have some measure of constant time protection. These are, this is a wonderful thing. It's really updating the fundamental crypto libraries out of the 90s. And then when, you know, when the researchers come to Europe and they say, look at all, all our deployment. People, Google wants this, Mozilla wants this. 
you know, everyone in the United States wants this. Of course, because the large, some of the larger companies in Europe are so utterly clueless about crypto, they don't even know about it. And they can't get support from the European Commission because there's not a clear telco involved or the you non know, SAP may not have signed something. I think that's quite unfortunate because I think you know Europe should be looking and even if Europe, for example, may not have a Google or Mozilla which is wholly based in Europe, have European cryptographers work is being used as large scale products, both for profit and non profit overseas, this gives Europe a long term competitive advantage that should be recognized and supported. I'd like to add, uh, I think I said there's two, two positivities. The one positivity is that in Europe is that uh, for startups, uh, there's the SME instrument by the European Commission, which acts like a, a series of a round A funding, very small amount of round A funding, up to two million, where you don't have to give any equity back. So if you're a startup, this is like amazing. Um, so that's really positive because the Americans don't have that. They actually have to go to real VCs and give up real equity to get their money. So that's, we, we've got an advantage there. The disadvantage, I'd like to echo Harry, is that uh, I think the Commission focuses far too much on big style dinosaur companies like SAP, etc. You mentioned it, so I'll just mention it again. But, uh, but, yeah, but they're, they're a bit. The, the, uh, yeah, but there, there's too much of a focus on the bigger companies rather than the SMEs, which is where you're going to get technology growth and innovation. Um, so. Again, I think I sense consensus on the panel in, in something I said previously when we're looking on the standard discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, what are we solving for when we're pushing for a particular standard? Are we solving, are we answering a market need to meet the capability in the market that is required? So, in which case, something new, innovative, capable, um, Perhaps not standardized yet, but worth being standardized, coming from a small company, is what we need to be pushing for. Are we actually trying to promote European competitiveness by pushing standards? Or pushing a particular standard or a particular choice of standards? Or are we using standards as a market barrier and as a way to keep alive uh, European dinosaurs? Um, based on the comments of the previous speaker. Um, I, I think that the comments, I, I, I think the comments of the previous speakers are actually demonstrating all possible three uses, all possible three options, and also demonstrate what may or may not be going that well in Europe. So, from my and, and, and how, frankly, large corporates use lobbying and use standards in order to stifle innovation or prevent, create market barriers prevent entry into the market of their competitors. So, again, from, from my perspective, when we're looking, when we're entering a standards discussion, these are the kind of things that we need to be looking for, and we need to be thinking of how we want to address them. Um, I would like, if, if nothing else, I would like you to be thinking about the question of, if I want to create a different, new capability, something that would be competitive, something that would create a new market, then on one hand, what is the market the need that I need to answer for? And in that sense, I'm actually, I actually do not know about the question, the point of VC is extremely encouraging if that, if, if that is the case. And then on the other hand, who do I need and how do I need to partner with in order for me to be able to enter the market? You see, my experience, in the business has been that historically it's not the technology that fails you. You may have the best technology. You may have the best technology than the competition still to lose. I mean, Microsoft versus IBM back in the 80s. Okay? It may have to do with simple things like where do you put the price tag? Or it may have with simple things like who do you partner with in order for you to be inside the channel that will lead you to the customer? Okay? Therefore, again, the discussion of not duplicating, partnering, because actually, quite frankly, the American and the European uh, uh, IT ecosystem is symbiotic. The, American, the Europeans have the big telcos, they have some legacy companies, 
They are trying to build innovation and they are trying to build new and more. The American side, on the, other, on the other hand, has been leading some other areas in the ICT, but equally the Europeans have, are further ahead on the industrial, on the traditional industry. So where, where do these two worlds meet? In IoT, in smart energy, in cloud, that is where we need to be focusing and thinking about innovation and this is why concepts like we'll, we'll build the European Google here on our own or you know, the European Internet Explorer for that matter are in my eyes the, the most certain way to miss the boat. Just a quick point, so I actually think uh, the, the GPDR provides opportunity for Europe yes. and, and you know, companies, I'm just going to actually call it SAP because I have worked on uh, some things, are actually not total dinosaurs because occasionally it's hard to get things approved, but they actually have very interesting techniques for they were interested in using cutting edge technology to enforce GPDR privacy. They view some competitive market being there. That being said, um, that, uh, problem that they have to some extent is uh, it's, it's like th th there's an issue where they would like to use cutting edge technologies, there may be no standards there, and even though maybe often they have research divisions or internal divisions that are very you know, maybe progressive, um, they have trouble sort of putting that in a product. And we've seen this uh, time and time again, and I think that the real issue has been on some level the, the funding of new innovative crypto, where you do have, I honestly, you know, I think you have better applied crypto in Europe than the United States to a large extent. I mean, almost definitely, it's, it's globally recognized. The funding of that industry has been very hard. And the funding of that through academia has not been of such, so good, such that it's possible to keep some of the talent here in Europe. And that situation is unfortunate from even a global perspective because there is currently a large trust deficit in what large American companies as an American and there's increasingly a trust deficit even with American based standards bodies. Now that solution is probably not to replicate the standards bodies. You don't want entry or whatever creating something, a European version for no good reason of something. Uh, that being said, there is definitely innovation gaps where Europe can make a big difference where Europe has a lot of trust and Europe has very educated young people working in cryptography and also blockchain and some innovative legal systems, uh, depending on how you think about innovation in terms of legal in Switzerland and other things. Uh, but I don't, I don't feel like this is being satisfactorily taken advantage of it. There's probably going to be a window of opportunity. And this window is not going to be open forever. Eventually, some other countries, I'm thinking looking at blockchain technologies, primarily Singapore. Uh, uh, you know, are going to eventually take advantage, trying to move a lot of funding and talent uh, away from Europe, maybe not the United States, but somewhere uh, in Asia. I think it's not entirely possible. Okay. Um, well, just uh, a number of uh, uh, random comments. Uh, I was, uh, as I was listening to my colleagues, I was thinking uh, about. Uh, examples where a regulation created a new and sustained market and I couldn't find one. Uh, well, it's true that uh, the data protection directive and now GDPR uh, have introduced certain principles that uh, made a difference in how privacy is treated throughout the world. But just like Sarbanes-Oxley in the US that introduced a different uh, set of principles uh, it did create a compliance market uh, and it did create marketing efforts around it. But if you compare it with two new markets created, something like, you know, NCSA Mosaic uh, and the standard that appeared afterwards, which really changed the world, it certainly uh, is not going to do uh, anything uh, like that uh, outside of uh, the matters of uh, principle. So, um, uh, well, by the same token, uh, uh, as I was uh, listening to the discussion about crypto libraries that are very important, I was remembering a project I had uh, when I started my career outside of academia. 
uh, that was an evaluation of crypto libraries that were available at the beginning of this century. Uh, and when I remember this list, uh, I can tell you that most of the companies uh, that were on this list uh, or groups that were libraries producers do not exist anymore, whereas Baltimore, uh, where are many, many others, they had uh, excellent products, but the market does not need um, uh, 45 libraries unless they are highly innovative uh, for the new environments uh, where they operate. So we can transfer this, uh, you know, uh, lesson to uh, how uh, technology startups uh, are funded uh, in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, well, we could also compare with Israel, but that's probably a different story. So um, uh, both uh, countries actually make an effort to uh, both regions, I should say, make an effort to. Uh, support small and medium uh, companies rather than large companies when uh, it comes to innovation. Uh, but what I observe in Europe, and I sort of live both in Europe and in the US, uh, so I'm familiar with uh, both environments. Um, what I observe in Europe uh, is that uh, something that has created, uh, based on an interesting idea, uh, a niche pre-product, would be called a startup 20 years later, uh, well, 10 years later for sure. So uh, in the US, uh, these efforts that started out as uh, innovation, uh, but then uh, ended up being an interesting product for a very small number of uh, potential takers, become uh, co contract-based uh, companies uh, that uh, sell their products to a couple of organizations. I think uh, it's not uh, a matter of uh, the lack of innovation or even uh, the difference uh, in the funding models, although, uh, of course, there is a lot more venture capital available uh, in the U.S. from what I can see. Uh, I think it's uh, a requirement for dynamism, uh, where uh, in the U.S. you have sort of a non-forgiving uh, environment uh, where if it doesn't work out, um, that it takes a different route, whereas uh, in Europe there is a lot more compassion for uh, small companies and good ideas uh, that haven't worked out. Um, and uh, I don't know um, uh, which model uh, is better, but in terms of the pace of innovation, uh, the US model obviously uh, has uh, a faster pace. Um, I'd like to say something on GDPR because I've spent a good five years of my life in the negotiations of GDPR. I've spent another two years um, educating the company on the impact of GDPR, while another two years also talking to customers about what GDPR means for them. Um, I agree with Claire, actually it's very difficult to disagree with Claire, but I do agree with Claire that innovation, or if you like, a sustainable market as a result of just the regulation, HIPAA SOCS is, is not going to exist. At the same time, I, I have a different, I don't disagree, but I have a different optic. Not so much on GDPR in itself. In the end, GDPR is a very big, big piece of legislation demanding a number of things and will drive to some degree of compliance uh, organizations around the world. And by the way, GDPR has a global impact in many ways that many, many organizations pay attention to. As a side note, I'll say that the amount of questions I got from Asia or the Middle East on GDPR or even from American customers, you will not believe. So, is GDPR something relevant? Is GDPR something that, if, that the world has stopped and paid attention to? Yes. But it is exactly for that reason that I believe that GDPR will actually be something different. What do I mean by that? GDPR, the impact of GDPR will be to raise the overall level, awareness, compliance, and expectation of privacy. I see that very much in the Asian region that I'm responsible for, 
Because if you look at, for instance, Japan, Korea, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Australia, India, I mentioned to you the countries that come top of mind, they're all looking either to equivalents or to some version of GDPR or some version of 9546 for their own country. What does that tell us? That tells us that that tells to me at least that GDPR, whereas in itself will not necessarily create a sustainable market, it creates the framework conditions to drive privacy and privacy innovation through technology, potentially at the global scale. It will not necessarily be just for compliance. It will, there will be a big compliance problem. It will not be, however, just for compliance, but it will also be around answering the customer expectation, the customer demand that you are, you as a corporation, you as a company, that you're going to be rated by your customer whether you're privacy friendly or not. In that sense, um, and that's a favorite topic, you know, from the industry whenever I'm on a panel at the European Parliament and I'm asked the question, is this regulation going to stuff for innovation? But I look at GDPR, looking at it and thinking, well, you know what, I don't know. I don't know why, because um, if, if you, it's actually fascinating, I've, I've done this discussion in, in one of the parliamentary hearings, if you look at the way the technological trajectory looks like, if you look theory of innovation, we're going down the tunnel. And that, the tunnel is the technological trajectory, and we have to decide which lane we're going to take. The GDPR forces us into a tunnel in a particular lane. Now, that lane, that direction deep inside the tunnel <coughs> hall, may actually lead us to somewhere that there is a lot more economic, economic growth. There's a lot more positive development. There's a lot more innovation. The fact is we don't know it. And I don't think anyone in the Commission, at least at the time that the proposal was designed, did the innovation, did the innovation maths did the macroeconomic analysis. What they did it was always having money from bureaucracy and sort of like single market and all that. That's probably true. I don't know if it's the billion that was promised, but it's probably true. So this is the distinction, if you like, from my perspective, when one looks at the GDPR, the impact of GDPR on innovation and all these kind of discussions. Are we going to see more or less innovation? I don't know. But do I expect that we're going to see privacy innovation, perhaps the global scale, driven by, 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 by let's say, um, ideals like the ones that GDPR espoused, espoused to, absolutely. So returning, I just want to follow up, so to return and watch the Europeans do, we want to jump ahead and not repeat FIPS, but not repeat NIST. We need to actually standardise all the crypto algorithms from a crypto perspective to standardise the crypto algorithms that support privacy because that's where our advantage is going to be. Any other questions or comments? Yes.
Now coming back to the issue of certification and standardization and the market. So when we looked at certification, you cannot believe how many certification schemes are out there. So apart from the common criteria which is used for government, perhaps the most well-known, and as cryptographer, some of you may end up working in that business, is the EMB. So the, I don't remember what the E stands for, but Master Card and Visa. So they have a whole certification program including all the, the crypto used there. And if you look at the any, let's say, crypto or encryption device, commercial encryption device, you will see a range of the In any case, but my question to you as uh, the academic community is are the following. So once we have, let's say, an algorithm, the question that keeps coming up is what does reasonably good encryption look like? That's one. The second thing is, once we determine what reasonably good encryption looks like, how do we assess that it has been implemented well? And that is more important and is growing of importance every day. Because everybody keeps saying encryption, whether as a protection of integrity or of that, of functionality, is used to mitigate certain risks. The most recent example that I uh, encountered, which I didn't expect to encounter, was in the context of export controls, so dual use items. So there the question coming from the US colleagues was, can a company store information or intellectual property that is under export control regulation? I don't know, plans for a weapon or some chemical or a laser. Can it store it in the cloud? Or would that be considered an export? And our American colleague said, well, if you encrypt it reasonably well, then, and you keep control of the keys, then it's not an export. So the Americans said, okay, we have fix. Okay. What does reasonably good encryption mean in the EU? EU? And then we have to say, well, we don't have an EU reasonable encryption because it's true. And if you spend some time talking to the national authorities that decided to unpublish the ESA report, there's a question of, let's say, accountability and authority. You can believe them or not. They make reasonable arguments. But the fact is we don't have an EU-wide reasonable standard or a thing for EU reasonable. But coming back to the whole so coming back to the whole reasonable Harry, allow me to use this Harry. So Harry mentioned uh, this, um, the use of a formally verified encryption algorithm in Mozilla. So the questions for you as a community in the future is when I, as a user of encryption, seek assurance in the quality of encryption, why should I start asking that the encryption primitives or algorithms are formally verified? And is that a sufficiently common, will that become a sufficiently common requirement in order for it to be best practice and then standard? So these are the kind of questions that we, let's say, as users, dumb users of your uh, work, are, are looking for to you for the answer. So, what kind of confidence can you give me that your work is reasonably good? How much does that confidence cost? Is it is are there more or less cost-effective ways to give me that confidence? So these are the kind of uh, Questions we are looking for. Claire mentioned automated testing. So, again, are there uh, principles, are there automated tests that can make uh, confidence in technology? Actually? And to come to go beyond encryption and talk about other security things, such as antivirus, for example, again, lots of people are getting or using, installing, or telling people to use antivirus, firewalls for all these years. What kind of confidence? Because now people, for better or for worse, people in companies are starting to be accountable for the security choices they make. 
how can we help those accountable to prove that they did their due diligence? That they didn't just pick any random, cheapest product of the market. That they had some confidence that what they put there would protect your data, my data, or the actual product. So when coming up, talking about certification, for us it's ultimately how can users have confidence in the products they are buying, in the services they are using. And it's not just government. The military, that's 30 years ago. It's every single company today, from banks to hospitals to everything. Yeah, I, I, I can address the, the, the formal verification component of that question. And I think um, the team and other people from the will bring this up again tomorrow, which is that when we began uh, doing standards for the web browser in the space, uh, the form verification uh, technique was primarily supported by European Commission R&D grants. We used some of those tools uh, to try to verify our APIs. And those were very useful. We actually found that to be a, a productive use of our time. And then form verification that being applied to old standards, such as TLS 1.2, has found tremendous numbers of attacks. You know, has published many, many attacks, and that if you go to a place like MIT today, where I used to work, uh, MIT is using form verification talk, which is a product of a you know, giant pile of French PhD theses. Whether you trust that or not is a question, but regardless, it's interesting that I think Europe is doing actually exceedingly well developing research in this field, and now the researchers are deploying it. You want success in large code bases uh, such as Mozilla, so I do think that formal verification is a very good example of how to create trusted code. Um, and otherwise, you get the situation if we have lived in curves where people, Daniel Bergson will be here tomorrow to tell you his opinion, uh, where people did not trust the NIST elliptic curves or just noticed they were badly designed and too slow, and they wanted new elliptic curves that had no patents, and this was suggested by various professors, um, Daniel Bernstein in particular, but also Tanya Long and many other people, and that eventually all of these wonderful new faster crypto libraries with smaller key sizes were deployed and have had tremendous impact on spreading the use of encryption on the web. That being said, form verification takes a long time. There's been, even recently as of last year's, errors found in the implementation of these curves in OpenSSFL like last year, right? So, you know, it, it's, I, I, it, and the problem is because form, form verification is very time consuming and it's just as formally verifying the model, ideally you want to synthesize the code from the model that you verify, otherwise you know your model may not match the real running code. And this is an area where we're seeing tons of interest from companies because no company wants to see their fundamental crypto libraries broken. Uh, we're seeing lots of interest from standards bodies, and we're seeing a true large amount of expertise, mostly coming from Europe, such that the Americans are using the European tool sets. But there needs to be more support because it's a slow, painful process, and only recently has it been rewarded within traditional academic circles in terms of publications. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting, and it's kind of mirrored in the kind of levels that you would see criteria. So if I, I'm just taking that as an example. So for example, the reason you have crypto standards in the first place is, you know, that we're going to standardize AES is so a company doesn't come along with a snake oil encryption algorithm. And then you want to say, okay, is the implementation of that uh, encryption algorithm actually follow the standards? So then you might be using uh, code coverage, you might use automated testing, then you want to know, you know, then the next level up of assurance, you might want to formally verify. Now, it would be kind of nice if we could have that as a cheap way of verifying new crypto functionalities. So, you know, if you are a company and you, and you want to use this new crypto functionality, you go, is it, has it been standardized? Is it stake oil? Yes or no. Um, has the code been, uh, you know, tested with code coverage, da, 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 yes or no, and for all the way up to uh, formally verified. I think we're going to get, a, it's going to take a long time to get to formally verified of all crypto code out there. I think in maybe 10, 15, 20 years time, I think that's going to be the norm. But until we get to that as the norm, I think we need, we need some process of, of allowing companies to understand what new functionalities they're using, and whether they get some warm, fuzzy feelings about using it. 
think you're supposed to say something about antivirus. <laughs> well, no, no, no. <laughs> if that Zawar was mentioned, so, you know, as uh, somebody who started the antivirus business and then 20 years later said that the antivirus was bad, I think I may have a few examples uh, that was mentioned. So, um, what kind of confidence do I get that the AV I'm using is protecting the data? Guess what? If you don't have confidence in that AV, don't use it. There are 15 different, 16, 20 different providers of antivirus. Some of them are for free, some of them ask money, some of them are certified. If you believe that, and that, that, that the security software, if you believe in the security software you're using, for some reason there's no guarantee the safety of your information, you shouldn't be using it. By the way, I can point to many, many people that made between the choice of I'll invest on security and I'll get this baseline for free, chose for the free, and we can imagine at least for some of them what happened to them in terms of the security of their data. And I'm saying this why? Because experience has shown that often people um, will make a decision that is the cheap decision versus the right decision. So in that sense, I welcome things like GDPR because it also comes with a stick in showing what can go wrong if somebody makes the wrong decision and doesn't take their fiduciary duties properly on how they need to be protecting their information. Um, again, when we're discussing about a certification system in that area, and by the way, sure, if we are trying to solve for the right technical problem. Because the way you frame your question is the techniques, I tend to think that the technical problem is not the assurance of, of the security product, but actually the, the reversal of liability, meaning I've put that security tool, for some reason I got breached, I want to blame someone else. The fact that the tool that I deployed was not fit for purpose in that particular environment, the fact that I didn't update it, Shockingly, it happens often that customers don't update the security tools. And many, many other examples. I just want to blame somebody else for something that went wrong. So, if, if what we're trying to solve for is how can we have more assurance for the security software that we're having with the security in general, more than happy to discuss that, but I would insist then that the starting position of the discussion needs to be no certification, but things like baseline security, or things like um, um, security by design, which I'm not always sure that are the topics that we are starting to discuss when we go immediately into the certification discussion. And one final remark, since we're talking about trust, I'd like also to raise another, let's say, red flag that I have seen in many conversations. At least I, as a commercial provider, or as a representative of a or as a market operator, I have a vested interest in my customer wanting my customers to trust me. And by the way, if I fail in that vested interest, I'll carry the financial impact, meaning people not buying any more my product, and naming and shaming me and all the other problems. But at the same time, I would ask the question, how many governments certification scheme approving but approved by their national intelligence agencies would you trust? Because I would argue that those security agencies may have a different objective than the objectives that we try, we as commercial operators try to pursue. <coughs> uh, just, uh, yeah, right. So, so yeah. in the interest of moving forward, just I got one so security is now an essential requirement in the new medical device regulation. And because it's medical devices that are implanted in your body, like pacemakers, these medical devices will have to go through the conformity assessment by a third party, as they do for others. So I think the need of confidence and assurance in security properties of devices is now way, way, way beyond the military sphere. It's entering our body. So I think 
while there is a room, while there is a place, of course, for the national intelligence discussion, and I think there's a panel for that tomorrow. I think there's so much that we need to do that over the next years on the non national security part. Cars, medical devices, machinery, toys, we've seen that. And I think we need to leave the spies to spy and see how we can solve everybody else's problems first. And the spies, they know how to solve their problems amongst themselves. That's, uh, that's a good point. Uh, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't think anyone here was talking about uh, the military uh, and the spies other than uh, when we mentioned the origins of uh, common criteria and its uh, potential then in this direction. Uh, but uh, what is also true is that the need for confidence and assurance is not homogeneous. There are so many things where uh, these needs are uh, representing themselves uh, in different ways. Uh, when uh, you are talking about a nuclear power station uh, that is connected, what is important to you uh, is its safety um, and um, its resilience and its reliability. And uh, you definitely want the security there certified, but privacy is not important in this context, even though uh, it will be much more important uh, in a connected medical device. Uh, well, what you need to think about is uh, the cost uh, of failure and what represents confidence. Uh, there are very, uh, there are quite a few proxies for uh, privacy uh, and security today, especially security. Uh, because uh, the environment uh, and the tools that we are using have become uh, different. Uh, of course, everyone is talking about IoTs, uh, IoT. Many um, IoT systems are also cyber physical systems, uh, in addition to uh, the uh, typical uh, computing connected device, they also have uh, a different type of physical subsystem uh, like a car, uh, like um, a connected uh, coffee maker, like a medical device. So uh, in all these uh, situations, uh, the confidence is acquired uh, not necessarily through security uh, directly, it might be acquired by such features uh, of safety that also enable security, or it could be acquired through uh, the confidentiality provided through privacy because it's uh, the most important feature in this continuum of privacy, security, reliability, safety, and resilience. Uh, I don't think there is um, any certification that looks uh, at systems in this way and the modern systems are all more complex than just security or, or just uh, privacy. So uh, I think in order to provide a viable certification for modern systems, first a lot of research needs to be done. Uh, like uh, the research that NIST and uh, industry and academia were doing on test automation, they discovered that um, it's possible to automate many, if not most, of uh, FIPS 140-2 tests for uh, algorithm implementation, but it's really impossible to automate uh, this uh, FIPS 140-2 uh, tests for hardware. So uh, there are many areas where we simply don't know how to optimize our environment to create this level of assurance that uh, we all need. Uh, it certainly will not be through creating uh, additional 2 million jobs for evaluators of software and hardware, right? Uh, it will be done differently. But uh, we don't yet know how, uh, and uh, I think that should be the next step. Um, uh, very quickly. Um, I, I don't think anyone on the panel disagrees with the points you're making about, um, let's say, automated cars, medical devices, etc., etc. My commentary and my reaction was focused specifically on the comments about the security of the security technology or the identifiable and verifiable feature of the security technology. 
You know all the examples you mentioned. You mentioned cyber-physical systems, and also you mentioned the bundling of software and hardware. So in the case of Icebreaker, in the case of the car, which as a system functions autonomously. Um, in that sense, it's all about what uh, actually Claire just mentioned. So it's about looking at what kind of baseline security do we need for that particular technology, the capabilities that it will have behind them, the ability to certify or at least trust and test the reliability of some of them, and what additional steps do we need to be taken for the use case for things like privacy or for things like integrity. So um, I think we're very open to that particular bit, but we approach it from a different angle when it comes to, let's say, the specifics of how this um, assurance needs to come to play. Okay, one final question, please. Just, just to point out some stuff. You, you rightfully say that standardization and certification is going to be a very long process, specifically with new technology. I haven't heard a lot about open source, about community-based kind of review, pen test, red team, whatever you call it. I would be very much into this because I think before the knowledge goes into a process that is verifiable, certifiable, there's minimum knowledge, common standard, how you call it, that should be a first ground of building something. I fully agree that the Commission has failed in standardization. There was a huge capacity for them to do something. What we're experiencing on the law enforcement market is trying to push the market without using the forcing of standardization by going open source. We use the Cybox case format. It's just basic data format from forensic tools to analytical tools. And we tell the community, the vendors, hey guys, can you do it please? Because it's good for you, it's good for us, and then I'll wave the red flag sometime. If you don't do it, I'm going to go to the commission, and in 25 years, they will provide us a certification value. But I think I believe in this as a first step for basic technology, something that is shareable also for politicians to start understanding that there can be some self-regulation around it. I think we have to close you, we're running out of time, but you can of course still discuss with the panelists. I hope you just summarize a few things. Maybe one brief story when, when I got some input from some of you when I testified to the legal committee uh, on the Snowden revelations. And one of the suggestions I made to the parliament was they should invest in the evaluation of the security of open source security infrastructure. I just made a beginner's mistake, I didn't mention an amount. So the parliament invested 1.5 million euros was about a factor of a thousand off, I think. <laughs> Next time I will be there, I will mention the amounts they have to invest. <laughs> but I think that's something where Europe should be going. Uh, I think if I hear <laughs> medical devices, automotive and so on, I think in addition to GPR, even more reasons to have an algorithm paper published by NISA. I don't think that it should be unpublished. And finally, I was very uh, optimistic after hearing Ilias, because it seemed that Europe can drive privacy or privacy internationally. So why should we not try also to, to drive security internationally and do more about this and actually say if you bring something in the market in Europe, you get a fine of 4% of global turnover if your product is not secure enough. And maybe that will change things, but maybe that's too far off. But I, I think we should close here and thank all the panelists for a very interesting panel. Thank you very much.